let's talk about the squad. Another kind of awkwardness entirely. Jamal, in fact, I'm just going to hand it over to you because you had a take in mind with this one. I'm just doing yeah, the pivoting. So the squad. Um, there are a lot of people. There was an article where the guy wrote, basically said, what happened to the squad? And I thought the article was really interesting because, he, you know, when you think about what it was under the Sanders um, run when he was running for office and you had all of these members who all of a sudden were lefties who were very loud, very, you know, we got to we have to primary some folks. We got to do all of this stuff. And then they get in office. And then the person who was we got to primary some folks, the people who were very antagonistic against the Democratic Party, all of a sudden became team players and not just team players, team players in a way that would not get the legislation passed that they basically have said that they were going to, you know, bleed on the flag in order to get passed and covering for the likes of Democrats. I mean, if you think back when AOC was asked about the force the vote stuff and she says, no, 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 you should really get Biden on stuff that you can push him on like a $15 an hour minimum wage. Well, why should I have to push him on something that he said he was already for? And so then you get this to come up and they can't even do that. Like meaning they don't go scorched earth to get their policy agenda passed. It doesn't even seem to occur to them. Mansion in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. So the question became like, what happened or what happened to the squad? How did they end up just, you know, these these guys who wanted to change things into a bunch of Twitter spats and basically allegiance and team is, uh, um, teamwork as opposed to getting the agenda done for their constituents? How do you see this? Or do you think I'm wrong on this? Do you think the squad was doing a great job and phenomenal work? Um, do you think they should have been more aggressive? Or do you think, no, the squad is playing within the context of party politics and they're doing what they're supposed to do? How do you view it? I'm just really disappointed in the squad. I think that uh, I don't know how the establishment got to them. You know, it's one of those things where I look at it and I think, what in the world happened? Uh, and the only... What's that? Like Jamal Bowman and some of these other people have just gotten into Congress. Yeah, so I... Like, They've just there, pop mama bear, close, <laughs> and this type of stuff. We've had people come on the show that were explaining, like, look, when you get behind the scenes, they're not going to go against Pelosi. Yeah, I just, that's the thing is, I don't know how the establishment got to them, but they have been nothing but an absolute disappointment, just as Democrats are a total disappointment. Uh, and I, I it, so I, the only thing, I mean, all we could do is speculate. How did they get to him? I mean, with other politicians, we know, we know that they're paid, right? We know that they're getting a bunch of campaign money. And so they don't want to go against their donors and big money backers. But with this squad, they don't have that. And so it's this real head scratcher of why then are they not willing to uh, hold the establishment, you know, a, a accountable and and hold their feet to the fire. And they're just not, you know, they just fall in line. They kind of go with this narrative and, it, you know, that kind of makes them popular. But then at the end of the day, they're unwilling to really, really hold the establishment accountable. Uh, so I just sit there and I think I don't maybe it's fame. You know, maybe they're addicted to the fame. Maybe they got in there and, and a lot of them come from poverty. You know, they didn't have much growing up. They didn't have much before they got into Congress and they start eating caviar. I don't know. And then they're thinking, wow, this is actually pretty cool. I get power. I get fame. I get caviar. I get champagne. I don't know. I mean, is that what it is? I there a lot of them are young They're, uh, but not all of them. I mean, it's I don't know. And that is the thing that is the scariest. One idea here is that they're wrong. What if we're wrong? What if we're what if we're naive? And uh, we had uh, we had Adam on the show the other day, the mononymous Adam. He didn't give a last name. But he was, he was a good guess. <laughs> right. Yeah, independent left. Independent right. left news guy. And he was talking about the media and the progressive media and alternative media and how the squad hadn't been making any appearances really. Like the closest the, the squad got to progressive media was showing up on uh, Rising, yeah. formerly of the Hill. Um, and that was as close as they came. And that was a while ago. And you haven't really seen much since then. But maybe what, maybe what we're getting wrong here, I'm going to put this is how easy it is or hard it is to actually change things or do much of anything if it's w different from what the vast majority of other people want mm -hmm. in Congress, yeah. you know, in, in D.C., in, in, on Capitol Hill, that kind of thing. Maybe it's simply difficult <laughs> and uh, a, a handful of people trying to change a massive system without any, any, any experience and without real deep connections uh, and without the ability, frankly, to have a base without themselves being sidelined by the Democratic establishment, maybe it's just a hard road to hoe. And uh, we expect a lot, or you guys expect a lot when it's it's not that easy. I don't know. That's a good point. I mean, but the thing is, if you're going to tell people that I need to primary some folks and I'm going to be a radical and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, yeah. and you know 
that it's against the interests of the party. You know, going in, I mean, the whole point of we got a primary some folks is because we need to get Democrats out. That's their point. Well, so it, what is the honest spiel then? I'm going to try and it's going to be hard and I'm probably going to fail and I'm probably <laughs> going to waste all your time. But I'm a progressive <laughs> and I believe in the cause. But here's the thing. And I want you to back me. It worked. She took Crowley out. Crowley had been there for like 30 years. They took out Bowman, took out, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but uh, uh, it'll come to me at some point. It worked. Whatever they did, it worked. I don't I don't know if it did. I actually don't know if it did. I think it worked for AOC, but I actually think that the last AOC. Yeah, other than her, I think that the last wave of progressives, when you look at the Justice Democrats and who was actually winning, I do think that the whole I think that the Black Lives Matter uh, movement actually made quite a bit of progress on that front. That is the one area where I think there was genuine and serious change was that there were we are seeing more black folks elected. And I think that was what people were looking at more than the economic policies or the progressive policies, as much as I hate to say it. That's well, unfortunate. Wait, why is that unfortunate? Well, because, because you want them to actually. Yeah, you want. Right. It's, it's, right. Exactly. It's one thing to do a policy that benefits a particular community, meaning Shane Stranahan gets elected. Shane Stranahan passes some kind of medical thing. And the larger percentage of the bottom population gets benefits from that. As opposed to I'm just putting a black person in. That's not going to do that. Right. Right. When do you want? It's that it's this notion of. All right, we're going to give you the theatrical politics from the 60s. Oh, we, we, black people can't get elected into positions. You put one in and everybody claps. Oh, my God, a black person got into that position. Well, it's 2021. And so it's like, OK, that black person got elected, but that black person is not going to pass any policies that benefit the community of the black person. And so it's like, what matters more, the policy or the theatrics of just kind of being a person there? Well, but, but isn't the weird thing about that? It, this is this is OK. So this is a sort of affirmative Look, action applied to wrong. politics specifically. I would love I hear you. I know the right person to be there and do the thing medical and pass the policy and pass the right. policy. But if it's either but or isn't that anemical, the policy. isn't that anemical to the nature of how our democracy is supposed to work? We are not supposed to elect people to serve just the, the uh, they're, they're supposed to serve their constituencies, but their constituency is supposed to be their constituency, right. not their race, nor their religion, right. nor any in any sort of, you know, way, easy way to divide it other than location. The bare minimum of a, your constituency is who elected you from a specific right. place, whether that place is a county, a state or a country. That's why I didn't break it by race. I said the people who are at the bottom of the income scale. But you see what I'm saying? Isn't it yeah. isn't isn't weirdly. So what is it then? The tokenism thing. If, if, if I'm going to use the slightly crude and outdated word, <clears throat> electing a token vice president like Kamala Harris, the, expect, the expectation isn't and shouldn't be that she is going to serve the interest of, quote unquote, the black community, right. even though there are plenty of black folks who would be satisfied yes. and for good reason to see her do so. That's it. It's the opposite of what our democracy is supposed to want. Kim, how, can you please make sense of this for me, <laughs> please? Well, Let's Kamala come. Harris should be serving the interest of us Asians is what she should be doing. <laughs> she is. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, we think you have somebody who's like, no, she should be serving the interest of blacks. Right. <laughs> Identity fight. <laughs> Her <laughs> real grand- grandma is exactly, yeah. of course, what you're talking about anyway. Have you ever run for a uh, high school office? Did you ever, either of you ever run for, you know, it's really a popularity no. contest. That's all it really it boils down to. Is. Yeah. So I think that's kind of what it is in politics. You know, it's just a popularity contest and they see, oh, this is the trendy person to vote for, whether that person be, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's a movie star and he's running for governor or whether he be or whether it be AOC, who's this rising star and you hear the rumblings in your community or whether it be someone who's black because you want to look like you're not a racist. I mean, whatever it is, right, people are not really voting, unfortunately, based on policy. Otherwise, we'd have a lot better policies. But instead, people vote based on, you know, what's trendy in in their area and what's cool who's popular that's what they go with but you know going back to the squad for just a second i do want to say that there are, there is power in numbers they could be banding together they could be doing what is best for us i think that they're each individually afraid of becoming a tulsi gabbard which is someone who was completely iced out of the party who was smeared by her own party uh was not given committee assignments you know she was on the armed services committee but beyond that right there was i can't but feel like if you that, keep doing that, Najmar, I know you wanted to go somewhere, but no, no, I can't help but feel like if you keep doing that, if you keep icing them out, well, they don't actually get iced out. They're still alive. They're still they vibrant political players in their yeah. own way with following. Aren't it's, you just making an opposition coalition at some point? Yes. Well, that's the what they should that, be doing, and that's how the squad should yeah. be treating it. But they're not. They're instead falling in line rather than being that opposition, loud opposition, by the way, who has the power of social media. They could be doing yeah. so much for us. Yeah. But yeah, they're not. not just social media, but the power to influence the vote. Right. I mean, the vote tally is so narrow in regards to the House. 
And that meaning that in the way that Joe Manchin can say, yeah, I'm not voting for that. I'm done. They could do the exact same thing. Well, but they could also make martyrs of themselves simply by getting pushed out of Congress if they did it with enough consistency, if they did it yeah. as a coalition, if they did it as a group. Well, you don't have to and do it they, constantly. I mean, what about Joe Manchin's excuse? How is Joe Manchin, <laughs> like meaning when Joe Manchin is deciding, I'm going to kill the COVID bill and I'm going to kick food out of the mouths of mothers in order to do it because I don't think American workers are work $15 an hour. How do you sustain that position of I don't believe American workers under the face of opposition and attacks? Well, he at least has Kirsten Cinema, right? He's got a part. He's got a partner. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. The, the one who's doing the down vote. Yeah, the, the down vote with yeah. the thumbs thumbs down. Yeah. I, I will be honest; I do actually kind of like her. Not her fashion sense necessarily. I like her fashion sense. I, I, like, I like her fashion her, sense. Her yeah, I like her fashion sense. I like her spiritual aesthetic. I don't know what it is. There's something about it. I don't like her policies, but right. I'm gonna. That's my. That's my hill. I'm gonna die on that hill. Jamar, you wanted to get to Gavin oh, Newsom. Yeah, one question, in thirty yeah. seconds. Uh, Gavin Newsom. So the recall. Why is Newsom being recalled? That's the first question. Um, and is he? going to beat that recall like that. It, it just it seems so weird to me. I didn't necessarily think Gavin Newsom did such a horrible job as governor where they would take him out of his office. What is going on with that? Well, you didn't live here in California. So that is true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, we have been under an intense lockdown that has we right. are not even fully lifted yet. So we're still, you know, for the rest of the country, I travel around and everything's back to normal. And there, by the way, are no, you know, bodies in the streets, two weeks, two weeks, bodies in the street. And we're not seeing that all around the country. And yet California remained under lockdown and restriction while Gavin Newsom was gallivanting around with lobbyists and dining at the fanciest restaurant in California. So while Californians are suffering, while California businesses are going under, Gavin Newsom just continued to rule with an iron fist over the state when other states were open and doing just fine by the numbers, or at least no different than us. We also still got hit hard, so it didn't help. So yeah, people want him gone. That's why he's being recalled, because basically California is saying you've done a horrible job. And I have some yeah. Well, it's it's funny, too, because I remember Gavin Newsom was along with Andrew Cuomo back yeah. in the day being, you know, paraded as one of the Democratic. We got it right. Here's how you handle the here, yeah. here's how you handle the coronavirus. Here's how you handle lockdowns. Kim, we've got to cut this short because we want to make sure we have enough time for calls. Thank you so much for the conversation. Fun, as always. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Great convo. Thank you. Absolutely. That was Kim Iverson for everybody listening. Great to have her on the show. Kim Iverson, independent journalist, host of The Kim Iverson Show on YouTube. Follow her, by the way, rockfin.com slash Kim, youtube.com slash Kim Iverson. And then I believe it is Kim Iverson.locals.com. I, I saw she was starting up a new new community over there. Anyway, go check her out. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. And we're coming back with your calls. Opening our lines up, 202-521-1320 is the phone number. Again, that's 202-521-1320. Be right back on the other side of this short break. 